Hello and welcome to Kicking Tires. My name is Jimmy. And I'm Justin. And today is all sports cars. From a really, really high level to something that's very affordable. So let's dive into the first thing here. The Lamborghini Aventador LP 780-4. This is uh this is the last hurrah for them, isn't it? Yeah, the the Ultima. So not not it's not a typo. It's not ultimate. <laughs> it's Ultima. Which I thought uh, it was a typo initially. <laughs> I mean, it looks like it for sure. If, if you know, for those of us versed in the English language, it it looks <laughs> it looks like it's spelled wrong. But um, yeah, what is unique about this? They've squeezed a little bit more power out of it, right? Mm-hmm. So the SVJ came out about two years ago. Uh, this one's got slightly more power than like like ten yeah. horsepower more. Seven hundred and sixty nine um, horsepower now. Yeah, it's not a hardcore track model like the SVJ. Uh, so the arrow is unique to this car, but it's not um, nothing too wild here. It's it's yeah, it's pretty predictable Lambo style. No big wings, no no odd vents. Uh, it's just a basic ground effects, and uh, yeah, it's a handsome looking car. It's definitely less ricer than the svj Mm -hmm. in lack of better words because the svj looks you know it looks like the the painting of a a 10 year old you know i mean like it's super aggressive in his looks it's not classic lamborghini this is classic lamborghini yeah this is what they want the aventador to be remembered as i guess is this is it's it's relatively elegant. It's still aggressive, right? It's still it's still got that classic Lambo wedge shape, and it the lines are you can't mistake it for anything else. No, definitely uh, not. And I I think that's one of the things that that's made Lambo really stand out is they they've stuck with uh, a very classic shape that you know in the last three four decades has still maintained over the years but it's still it looks different right you're not going to confuse this for the um the mercy and and the diablo um but you can see the roots which Mm -hmm. i really like and and the v12 essentially the v12 has been around for half a century and -hmm. it's just been a constant development and I'm not sure if this, uh, I'm reading the press release, I'm not sure if this means the V12 is gone for the next generation or if... Uh, I actually watched their introductory video on this. Um, mm-hmm. It sounds like the V12 will live on, but this is the last nationally aspirated V12 that they're going to make. Mm, okay. That's what that it sounds sense. like. But of course, only the future will tell. Yeah, there there might be uh, you know turbocharging going on or electrification going on with the next generation. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this car's been around for basically a decade, yep. the Aventador, and it's aged really well. I think. I think when it first came out, we didn't think that much of it. Right? It it right. looked a little bit like the Reventon that was pretty special, mm-hmm. um, and. This one's been around for a while. It's it's held up so well for a ten year old car. Like it just, it's you know, it's a styling exercise for the most part. Um, but it's got a lot of performance behind it. This one, they they took it a little bit more seriously performance wise. I mean, ultimately, if you want to track a Lambo, you're still getting a Huracan. I think that <laughs> is, uh, it's and yeah. it was that way with the with the Garrido as well. It was yeah. If you wanted to take it to the track, you get the, the cheaper, smaller one. Um, yeah. But this is the the supercar competitor, and I really like the, this car because it just um, it doesn't really compete against anything, if that makes sense. Yeah, like it, it's its own thing. It doesn't care. I I don't care what Pagani or Ferrari or anyone McLaren is doing with their cars. Like we're building this our way. Uh, it's going to look like one of our cars. It doesn't have to be the, f- the fastest necessarily. Um, although the SVJ did 
set some record laps at at the Nurburgring. Yeah, back in 2018. Um, 2018? No. 2018 or 19, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think that's one of the things that's kind of refreshing about uh, Aventador um, is that it's not like an arms race, like, oh, we're, we're chasing, we need 800 horsepower, we need, it's just like not constantly one-upping each other, it's just make a special car that they like, that looks good, and people want to buy. Yeah. So this is, the, of course, the last version. There's going to be 350 coupes and 250 roadsters that's going to be available. Um, I think the, the biggest problem with the Aventador, I mean, being a 10-year-old car is the interior. There's a lot of older Audi tech in there, uh, especially in that center console. MMI 3G. Yeah, it's <laughs> it it just doesn't date well. I mean, if you sit inside a brand new McLaren, that like <laughs> that's night and day difference, right? Like you, yeah. you really get to see, you know, what a real tech um, supercar would be versus this. But I mean, I don't think people really care about that. You know, when you're buying yeah. an Aventador, when you're driving it on the street and you're showing off, which really you're buying a Aventador for, who cares about the infotainment? <laughs> yeah it's, it's got like some like manta ray sound system if i remember correctly but like no it didn't even sound good yeah uh you know and that that's one of the things is that the hurricane actually got a mid-cycle refresh with the interior hmm. uh got the touch screen panel and everything got updated a little bit i think the backup camera is still terrible from what i remember uh but that that car definitely has one of the worst backup cameras in the market but they had to be a little bit more competitive with that because i think people that that maybe are shopping in that segment are more likely to cross shop whereas if you're getting the aventador you want the aventador and the quirk is kind of like that isn't that kind of part of the appeal is that it it, it feels you know a little bit more old school the, the interior is not futuristic at all yeah it's not even user friendly in an old school <laughs> way. <laughs> My 3G is not even that great. Um, but yeah, no, I think that might be part of the appeal that it's just imperfect. Like I think Lamborghini, that was one of the things when when it started to feel a bit like an Audi, people kind of felt, you know, this car, you know, what is it? Well, it's not it's not what Lamborghini used to be like you, you used to get into a Lambo nothing fits together you don't fit in the car nothing works and and it's, it's gotten it's, better but also yeah, the worse <laughs> it's gotten better but it's still bad and I think you, ergonomically it cannot be like amazing because even though this is the bigger Lambo it's harder to get in and out of and it's it, the transmission is very quirky. It's not a oh, traditional <laughs> the single the single clutch, yeah. ISR transmission or whatever they call it. Um, yeah, it's 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 its own thing. And if you want this car, you want this car. You don't you don't want anything else. And you, I mean, you might want other things, but if you're shopping in this segment, you have the money to buy the other cars. Mm-hmm. So you don't you're not cross shopping per se. If you see it, you want it. And I, I do like this car. Uh, I like the subtlety of this Ultima edition. And I think the Roadster is the one to get. I think the Roadster lines uh, really complement this, this shape. Yeah, you, I mean, unless you're going top speed runs all the time, the Roadster definitely makes sense. But I recall the Roadster of the Aventadors are notoriously hard to put on. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I don't even. <laughs> Pretty know sure where it's you like a put... tent system that comes up. It's like a two-piece thing because where else are you gonna put it? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely not the easiest. I mean, you can kind of see it here, I guess. But yeah. Well, I mean, it's a it's a final goodbye. But you know, like all V12 Lamborghinis of the past, you know, kind of lives in our hearts. Um, like myself, the Diablo SV, you know, playing that within Need for Speed 3, I think it was, mm-hmm. always will have a place in my heart. Love that car. Yeah, and I, I think they, they've they done a good job in not 
cannibalizing or or making the first few Aventadors obsolete, you mm-hmm. know, because the overall shape is the same. And yeah. that's the thing that I always say about McLaren is that with a McLaren, you, your your car is obsolete in two years. The one two years later is going to be so much faster, better looking, way better inside and out and more reliable. And it's just like everything improves so quickly for that. And even Ferrari, they've changed their their flagship a few times. Uh, The Aventador stuck around Mm -hmm. for for a decade and it it builds some brand loyalty there, I think. Uh, yeah. And I think if you have the old one, you you might want to get the new one because you're like, well, I mean, whatever comes next, uh, because they've kept it kind of the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That totally makes sense. Speaking of companies that, you know, are still around, Lotus. <laughs> They're actually not really around here in Vancouver no. anymore. You You can barely buy one. Um, but Lotus is still making cars. Uh, they're not bankrupt, not yet. Anyways, they're they're still around, and they made a brand new car. It's called the Emira, um, and it's to kind of replace the Elise as well as the Evora. Um, this is an amazing looking machine. It, it yeah. looks absolutely fantastic. It looks like a supercar. It does. Oh. It's not it, priced like a supercar. It's, no, it's priced like a sports part. car. Seventy thousand yeah. US. It's what it's going to start at. I mean, yes, I know starts at, but even a starting point, you're still going to get an AMG source four cylinder, which should make all the right noises. And like all Lotus, it's not about power; it's about handling. And it's the same guy. Um, crap, I forgot his name. Gavin was it? I forgot. It's the chief chassis design guy that's been around forever. He's like one of the best drivers around and whatnot. Gavin I forgot Kershaw. His... Gavin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, I was, I was like, oh, pretty sure it was Gavin. Director Anyways, of vehicle attributes. Yeah, he <laughs> still, you know, took care of all the handling side of this vehicle. So there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, this Lotus will still handle as well as the previous ones. And that's what Lotus has always been about, right? Yeah, and this is not to be confused, you know, that with the uh, what's that other electric car that they're coming out with the the oh the E something I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> I know it's it's Evija. <laughs> that sounds so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but this is uh, it's a combustion engine. It's it's only a, an internal combustion engine, so nothing crazy there in terms of of power plant it, it's something predictable it's something traditional uh i like the proportions a lot it's like a mini ferrari or five eight <laughs> it's very like and and it's it's somehow better for it like it looks yeah. even better and i think this is this is what we need to shake things up right like we had the the alpine a110 a few years ago obviously we didn't get it here in north america but that that kind of um it made its way into the conversation right it was it was a real competitor for the cayman but i think there still hasn't really been a really strong competitor for cayman i think this is gonna be it yeah um this is that two-seater sports car that is going to be just so dynamic and it's gonna I think it's it's a Lotus. They can't. They won't mess it up. No, they won't. They, they can't. won't mess it they up. They can't afford to mess it up either. <laughs> yeah, they've never. They never really have. And uh, the the Evora was not a great success. I think um, because they try the Evora, to go soft. They tried to go GT with that one, and it yeah. didn't work out. No. This looks like a good in between point where it's. It looks a lot more comfortable to drive than a Exige. Uh, yeah. You no, know, this is a lot more livable. But As interior panels. <laughs> we're not fooling ourselves with uh, two plus two. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it is still a dedicated sports car, it's, but it's got some cushioning to it. So there's two engine options. Um, as mentioned previously, a two-liter four-cylinder 
AMG sourced. Um, it's the same A45 engine um, that's used, but it's making a little bit less power, 360 horse. Um, but you can also get the optional supercharged Camry V6. That's the three and a half liter V6. It makes 400 horsepower. Um, that's the same one that's in the Evora, slightly detuned, but like it's two really compelling engines. Um, and I think like the two liter four cylinder, like I drove, I driven the, the CLA 45, which is the exact same engine. Like, yeah, there's a little bit of turbo lag, but it, it, it really pushes you back in that seat. It really flies. And in something that's lighter, this is going to be amazing. Yeah. And, um, the press release does say it will be available both as a manual and an automatic and a DCT. So I think that's the thing I wasn't a hundred percent sure about. I think is the automatic being paired with the, the Toyota engine and the DCT is with the AMG engine. Mm. Um, but manual, like that's, that's, uh, that's pretty huge. I think, I think that that is going after the, the Cayman, right? Uh, yeah. Corvettes ditched ditched their manual transmission. Uh, it wasn't a priority, uh, but it, Lotus being Lotus, I think they they still try to keep things simple, um, and so I think that's why they they offered the manual. Yeah, it looks like from the press release. I'm just reading it up right now. The it's a three and a half liter supercharged Toyota V6. That's gonna have a manual as well as that dual clutch. Whereas the two liter looks like it only comes with a dual clutch. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. I, I mean, really no, no full details just yet, of course. But yeah, yeah, uh, zero to a hundred kilometers in less than four and a half seconds, like super quick, and like it's it's not, it's not like it's not a straight minimal. line car, right? And that that's something to note too it's a lotus at the end of the day it's not mm -hmm. you don't take this drag racing that's not what it's meant for <laughs> um you will get smoked by a model three like uh, <laughs> you know for this money uh, you don't you'll you'll be smoked by if uh you know this is about the same zero to 60 as a two, two liter supra um but i think this type of car is not long for the world and the I think the approachability with the price point is is really what what appeals to me for this car, mm -hmm. and I like that they partnered with they partnered with uh, AMG and Toyota with for for their engines, which is awesome because you don't want the Alpha Four C like, <laughs> like you know sometimes you just can't make a competitive engine like toyota and mercedes they can make they're they're big manufacturers that that can that can properly develop an engine an engine has so many parts to it and there's just so many places to go wrong and i think that's why the 4c you can still buy brand new ones that are a few years old now um but yeah, I hope to see this car here. Hopefully, it will pass whatever safety and stuff that needs, to, you know, that the, the the legal red tape that it takes to get a car into North America. I know there were other models that didn't quite make it through, and yeah, as a sort of boutique brand, I, I love I love seeing this. I would love to see this thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 3,100 pounds. That's all the ways in the lightest form. 3,100 pounds. That's nothing. Yeah. It, it It's kind of nothing. I mean, a Cayman is, what, just about that weight, too? Cayman S. Um, so not, not too far off there. I think Cayman S, if you go, like, stripped down model, like with a manual and stuff, it's slightly under 3,000. Yeah, um, it is 2972. So that is the thing. This, yeah, I wonder why this is a, a slightly higher weight. Maybe it's bigger engine or stuff like that. But I, I think this looks cooler than it came in, though. Like, a, yeah. yeah, like this is this is a way more unique the looking the car. I really it's like way that. more exotic. 
it, it, yeah. it is very exotic. I love that um, yeah. vent behind the the or in front of the rear wheel. It, it yeah. totally reminds me of the four five eight. Yeah, and the other Ferrari that came after oh, the four eight eight and the Tribuno. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I think styling wise, this is uh, <laughs> they they really nailed it with this car. Mm-hmm. And it, it it did what they they sought out to do is get that shrink wrap look, which you got with the the Exige. Uh, yeah. before it just makes it look really tight you know the pushes the wheels to the corners of the car and um yeah just makes the car look visually look very light 3100 pounds i think for a two-seater uh mid-engine car is not that light but um you know in in the grand scheme of things it is still pretty light by today's standards yeah with all the electronics that it has inside and the amenities i mean it looks pretty fulfilling inside there's still like a full 10 and a quarter inch touchscreen a digital cluster like there's a lot of tech that's in here it's not just like blank Mm -hmm. yeah well let's move on from lotus here um into you know i mean the lotus is a very beautiful car right and but then, it is very low volume, and it is not something that a lot of people will really experience. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas but this one, it, there's going to be more people that will experience this. But uh, I'm not maybe. sure about the looks. <laughs> okay, so the car we're talking about is the BMW 2 Series Coupe, uh, the G body version of it. Um, not sure the exact chassis code, maybe G20. I'm not too sure yet. Um, But basically, they've launched the two models officially. So from BMW Press, we see the 230 and the 240. The 240 being the M model. M version, yeah. uh, And then the 230 being kind of the more standard issue one. Uh, What they've done... I don't. The controversy with this car, I think, is is the lights, not the grill. Believe it or not, the grills are not driving people the nuts grill is because fine. the grill is very fine. <laughs> it's it's it looks great. Ah, I mean, the I grill think... doesn't match the the car quite perfectly. Um, I don't mind this car. Like, I think I think a lot of people are. You are I think a lot of people hate it. <laughs> um, it's okay. So like the front end, front three quarters, I think it's great. The the fenders are super aggressive, front and rear. The, the tail light is upside good. down. I'll get there. I'll get there. The front, <laughs> the headlights look good. The the front grill looks good. Side profile, I think it looks great. You know, the bulging fenders once again. You know, it makes a pretty good line on the side. And then you get to the rear, like the tail lights, they they look horrendous. They're sunken in. They just need to flip it upside down, and that will fix it. I don't know why the swoosh is that way, because on every other BMW, the 3 Series, the 4 Series, it's it goes the opposite way, and just, just makes no sense. It's a little bit too low, the taillight. Um and it doesn't it doesn't look like a BMW. It kind of reminds me of the Fiat 124 Spider. Mm. Just the, the 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 chunkiness of it. It just it slapped on there. The tail light is is not pretty. But overall the shape, I don't mind it. I think something weird about the M model that is not on the 230 is the black lower portions. Mm-hmm. Um so the the what I mean by that is the door sill or the rocker panel is painted gloss black and then the rear diffuser that wraps around the bumper is painted gloss black not just the center part but the whole bottom of the rear bumper we, um and the side skirt it's not just like the bottom skirt this is a huge skirt this yeah, is like it goes up to the door sill yeah door sill downwards is gloss black um visually it well, they debuted it on this purple color, which I think is sensational. The purple is beautiful. Yeah, the purple is, is pretty neat. I think the rear end, it will grow on me. I don't think I will hate it as much. One thing I do want to say is that it's grown quite a bit in size, and I think that's helped it stylistically. 
because the two cars that came before were not pretty in in a traditional sense in a, in a proportional sense the two series a lot better than the one series the one series is very ugly even the one m to me is ugly looks cool but ugly i think a lot of car enthusiasts worship that car but the one m is i don't know proportionally speaking it's got a squish nose it it's it's too short and it's too tall and it's just awkward looking uh and this one they've gained a lot of width and it just looks more more like an m2 if you look yeah. at an m2 visually versus an m235 you know five six years ago the m2 just looks so much better because they had the space to to wrap those wheels and the fenders around the overall body so it's not just slab sided and and tall um the m2 is not physically that much wider either but the little bit of width helps to make it to tie it together looking like a proper uh fr coupe now with this one it's gotten quite a bit longer 4.3 inches longer and yeah. it's kind of odd like the wheelbase looks a little bit too long wheelbase but... is two inches longer than before but i, I want to point out something from from looking at it on the side <laughs> it looks really weird yes the uh, well especially because of the gloss black uh side skirt but it's the length is gained in front of the rear in, in front of the side mirrors i want to say <laughs> is where that extra two inches yeah. went like it's not like oh we're gonna make the cabin bigger or the back seat bigger it's <laughs> it's that we can have more of a prestige gap is what they call it when you have a longitudinal engine layout uh you have what's called prestige gap between the the the, the front, front wheel, wheel and the, the door and the door opening there's there's a lot more space between the front wheel and the side mirror it looks like there's like a foot and a half there yeah um it looks so weird it's weird it is definitely weird like i don't know i don't think this car is as ugly as people say it is i think it will grow on us and i think it it has potential we need to see the M model. The, the designers the at BMW right now are just sitting there laughing. They're like, oh, we made it ugly and you guys still like it. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> the I I wanna see the M. I I think the M2 has some potential. Now all the M2 guys I know in our club are like, oh, this means our cars are gonna appreciate or hold their value better because the new one is so ugly. I don't <laughs> It it never really works out that way, does it? Like no. <laughs> hmm. I yeah okay. I th there there's many parts of it that I'm not a big fan of. Yeah. Now. Why don't we take a look at the two the base one? So uh, this is the the two thirty. Um, the yeah. two thirty. So there's two models, right? There's a two thirty i and the M two forty. The M two forty is um coming out with X drive, whereas the two thirty is coming out with rear wheel drive. Later on, they're going to have extra version of the 230, and they're going to have a real drive version of the M240. But at launch, it's only rear for the base, all-wheel drive for the top trim. Mm -hmm. The lower trim, it doesn't have the blacked-out like side skirt. It makes it look a little bit more high-end, maybe. Yeah. The front end, like it doesn't have the aggressive grill, which generally I don't like on BMW models, but this... It doesn't look bad. I don't I think I yeah, I like this a lot. I think for a base model. Oh, gosh, uh, the rear is still I, horrible. I, it looks better. I think it looks better in this. Okay. In the There's a bit of this that I like because it reminds me of the X1. You know what it reminds me of? 318 Ti or whatever it's called. Oh, the uh, the compact. <laughs> the compact with its the compact had its awkward tail lights too yeah um and you know just they kind of cut it short this one yeah i think that the non-m1 uh that that is... looks better no, that's 100 percent bmw x1 
the diffuser is very yeah that inc that that lower bumper that's yeah 100 uh bmw x1 it's, it's a lot of diffuser for not a lot of booty <laughs> like i'm just gonna say uh, i'm trying to pull up a picture of the m version oh yeah. okay it is not as similar but i mean you can or, or kind x2, of x2 more like maybe yeah it has but, a, that that's that great inlay i think that's that's where it comes from i prefer this style of a diffuser over that wrap around style diffuser and i definitely like the non painted side skirt mm -hmm. um the that front area doesn't look as uh doesn't look as aggressive with the yeah painted. because you don't get the jagged line going up yeah uh, and then back down on the side but there is a hard crease there you see that just behind mm -hmm. the front wheel yeah on the fender it's like flared out yeah yeah very m2 actually i think kind they of. did that just to break up the line a little bit so that it's not as long yeah there's nothing clean about bmw styling these days um it, it is its own thing and bmw is pushing the boundaries and well for I better tell or for you, worse i can tell you what they're not pushing the boundaries is the interior oh yeah it's, it's just a, it's just a three series interior. they just copied and pasted the three series and threw it in there because that's all yeah. it is which is all you I really mean, need in this it's, segment. it's fine it, it works but they're they're not doing anything unique um yeah. the two which, series ultimately is not a a volume car and it's not going to pay for itself so you do need to it's always been a part spin model um i don't know who it's really for especially in like the base trims because it's like hmm. i don't know I, it is, g42 so i think that might g42 be okay so that's the chassis code but yeah i, I i've never really <laughs> been that interested <laughs> <laughs> the concepts are, the concepts are wild the yellow one looks like the supra the <laughs> <laughs> they're looking at the character sketches right now for the this two series oh gosh piece. and they're they're wild oh. this one looks cool this one looks cool this one looks like the m version it yeah looks, looks super aggressive so the m could have potential here it, it I, I think the the m can have that what i'm actually a little afraid of is because of how the m240 already has kind of the wider fenders i'm yeah. thinking of the m2 would get even wider fenders or are they just leaving it so if you look at this concept sketch the m if it has a wider fenders it can frame off that tail light in a much prettier way mm -hmm. that the narrow body can't right uh you know yeah there, there is definitely potential the m2 could be could be quite attractive and yeah. it's gonna blow the old one performance wise out of the water so oh for sure uh, absolutely yeah um speaking of performance Let's talk Speaking about of the old M2 <laughs> <laughs> and performance. Yes, let's talk a little bit about it because um, you were on a track day with Area or at Area Twenty Seven. Yeah, say. yeah, the Rev Scene Track Day uh, with Calson and TSS guys. Yeah. So we brought up three of our cars to uh, from the Overdrive crew. So we have the the, the Type R. The Type R is brand new, so twenty twenty one. Nothing done to it really except for wheels and tires and brake fluid. So wheels and tires, really conservative setup, just a Continental 300 tread wear summer tire. So this is something that you could live with every day. And the Type R put down a mind blowing time to be, you know, I only drove it for four laps before it started overheating because it was just so hot out. All the tune Type Rs could put down about one lap. Uh, our stock car could do about three before it was it maxed out the, the coolant so so it was about 40 degrees wasn't it it was about Celsius. 35 when i went out but yeah it's it was a hot one so uh, about almost 100 degrees fahrenheit yeah so that's why that's why your coolant temps are up I, I maxed out the gauge after four laps and i wasn't driving that hard there was traffic uh, and i maxed it out and that's one of the things um if you're considering buying a track car is 
especially here in the Pacific Northwest where we get a lot of rain, our track season is really limited to the summer. And the downside to that is we're also dealing with a lot of heat. We don't have the luxury of running like an October track day or a February or March track day because you you could, but you do risk running into rain uh, during those months. Whereas uh, June or July up in Area 27 in, in the Okanagan is almost always dry, if not too dry, since all the forest fires. But uh, Type R cooling has some issue to it, but chassis-wise, I was just blown away by this car. All we did to it, it was just a set of tires, and it's a stock suspension. I haven't even done a wheel alignment on it. It's just put it in R mode, and it's just it handles the body roll perfectly fine. It's weird because on the street, the the rear actually rubs very slightly against the plastic fender, and mm. on a track, it doesn't rub. Uh, so nine and a half inch wheel, 38 offset, and only 255 tires. So nothing too crazy. Stock tires already 245. Um, and I it ran like a 230 optimal, which I thought was was awesome for a few laps. Like on a better day with less traffic and cooler weather it, it it will be a sub 230 car stock uh which is which is amazing and there's no suspension that was done onto this right yeah nothing nothing that yeah i think like wheels and tires wise retail on that is less than two grand nice so yeah it's it it's it's really no prep at all it was you know, because this is a family car, so uh, that's what the kids went up in, took all the luggage for four people, and, you know, you can carry a tent in that. So it's, you know, they went uh, picking fruits and stuff, and so it carried everything and then some. Um, the Supra, which we, I don't know if I have a picture of. No, you didn't put a picture of. (laughs) The Supra is brand new as well. So the Supra joined our fleet about, yeah, something like that. The Supra joined our fleet about three weeks ago. So again, nothing really done to it. I bought stainless steel brake lines for it, put in some really good brake fluid, Castrol SRF. Uh, We've got we stock that fluid, but it it flies off the shelf. Uh, so if you do want Castrol, that is, uh, we we are still bringing it up regularly. Um, but yeah, the Castrol SRF and just a slight, just alignment for that car because the Supra apparently is not very well aligned for track use from the factory. So we went and got an alignment for that and just straightened out the toe. Um, quite a bit of camber from factory. I think about negative two degrees all around, which is, which is decent for uh, for a stock car. Um, but the Supra a lot harder to drive. I've never, well, I've driven the M2 all these years. I have quite a bit of experience with the FR setups with the Miata, the and the M2 FRS. A Supra, it's its own thing. It's uh, somewhere between the Corvette and uh, the M2. It's It has some mechanical grip. The suspension is all over the place. Um, mm. Now, that's not to say it's a bad car. Um, I'll get to that in a bit. But uh, because it is a nervous car, uh, I could only manage about a 228. Uh, so it's about two seconds faster in a Type R, but it has a lot more power. Uh, has a really good intercooler. I think it's a, I think it's called, they call it an air to water intercooler. So the cooling wise uh, on a Supra and the B58 motor, uh, much better than the uh, Type R and better than the M2 as well, which is an air to air setup. Uh, the M2 is you know that's the, the car i've been tracking for the last four years so it's got a lot done to it the m2 um recently got a tune as well i was running the stock tune for for the first three years and now on the last year i decided to tune it just to see what it can do now with the tune it is putting down probably a little bit over 400 horsepower um so it's a, it's a powerful car um, on the street. Now, here's the thing. On the street, the M2 
peak power wise is better than the Supra. The Supra is great for low end stuff, the B58 motor. But on the street, uh, if you were to floor it, I'm pretty sure the M2 would win in a straight line. But the problem with the M2 and the Tune is that first lap, I hit 200 kilometers on the front straight, or 198, something like that. Second lap, 177. So oh, wow. within that one, that three minute difference, or two and a half minutes later, it's already lost 10% of the speed. And, you know, that's where the power is gone because of the heat from the tune because you cannot just buy a car and tune it and expect it to you know even if it dynos 15 percent higher it will not deliver 15 percent more power at all times and under all conditions in 35 36 degree weather when your oil temperatures are over 120 degrees it's not going to be able to deliver the same kind of performance and you can't trick yourself that's why i say that's why i was saying when we were talking about the super 2.0 and the 3.0 there they in japan the 2.0 is actually quite popular because the tuners get their hands on them and you can build those up well over 300 horsepower no problem but the thing is i'm like for the thing i said for the 3.0 is you, if you're thinking about tracking get the 3.0 because to make consistent you know, a hundred horsepower difference may not sound like much if you're just into street tuning cars, you know, and a, a downpipe and a tune on a GTI is going to get you 150 horsepower. But are you going to be able to deliver that lap after lap? Probably not. And that's where the three liter comes in. The three liter does not have to work quite as hard as a two liter. And, you know, when we were younger, we were like, well, okay, Toyota, like it took you, you're, you're 20 years down the road, you know, we're looking at the Supra 20 years, 25 years after the, uh, the, what, what do you call it? The fourth gen Supra. And we're still making the same power. Yes. And no, because we're making that power consistently. And that, that is the key is that every type R broke down on the track at this track day. Uh, no one could run a full session without risking blowing up their engine. Uh, and the Supra can run all day like that. The three liter, you know, w when we were younger, we look at it like, oh, three liters to make 380 horsepower. That's not a lot of power. And if you're looking at a 2020, 330, although underrated horsepower, three liters to do, to accomplish that task does not sound like much. But in the real world and on repeated testing and repeated laps if you need it to last a 20 minute track session that's actually asking a lot from an engine and that's why a two liter turbo that makes you know a, a tune type bar makes about the same 380 horsepower at the crank but you're getting one lap it's a one lap wonder if that if that yeah. and and that's where um i think i think car reviews and and magazines haven't been able to uh address that quite properly i think we're, we're always looking at a spec sheet mm -hmm. uh and so i can we cannot uh review a car based on just a spec sheet um and even just on street two now it really depends on what your intended use with that vehicle is because on the street i've 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 raced the, the, the type r and the m2 in a straight line and the type r takes the m2 because from the mid-range just just rolling you know a rolling start the the type r actually has more power but we're talking about lap after lap that's where that's where the bmw motor has more potential um so yeah the m2 was about two seconds faster than the supra even you know given all the the hot weather everything basically all conditions the same the m2 was about two seconds faster and i attribute that to the tires which are a little bit old they're a little bit heat cycled out but they're still better tires than the pss tires that were on the supra and the other thing being the suspension just being a little bit lower down a lot stiffer and just able to handle that level of g-force a lot better than the supra the supra was kind of moving around a little bit on the rear end and just not giving me the driver confidence that i wanted um now 
apples to apples, the stock M2 was much worse than the stock Supra. Uh, when I first tracked the, the M2, it was it was a pile of crap. Like honestly, that car, the, I don't know who who developed it, but getting it from an M2 into a Type R, the Type R feels like someone's track tested that and someone's tuned it to make it drive well on track drive easily on track uh no drama whatsoever and and no weird behavior the m2 was just awkward as as heck when when i first tracked it and it's taken years of of tuning the the, the alignment the coilovers the tires uh to kind of get it to somewhere that i felt comfortable tracking it and it is i am very comfortable with this car now um but yeah in stock form 2018 2018 i think maybe even december 2017 it was either january 2018 or yeah it was it was probably january 2018 um and that car that car has come a long way without doing that much to it it's got a thousand us dollars set of callovers bc racing and it's got a set of hand cooked tires, 18 inch tires. Uh, and that is basically all that it needed to, to, well, it also needed the amazing wheels. Yes. The, the <laughs> amazing wheels, the amazing wheels took a hit on this track day. So my dad, <laughs> my dad took the car out, spun out, uh, into the gravel and oh. gravel got lodged between the caliper and the, the wheel because oh. the M two's got 15 inch rotors and, way bigger than the Supras and they, they work okay, but they're huge. The calipers and the rotors are huge on the M2. And the thing is most 18 inch wheels do not fit the M2, only the TEs and the Advan GTs and a few other specific wheels fit uh, and actually clear the, the M2's brakes. I've tried a work wheel, I've tried ground lights, they don't fit. Um, and so, because the, the the gap is so tight between the caliper and and the wheel, the, the one of the wheels got a gash going all the way around the barrel, um, which well, probably just needs a repaint. But um, no, you're probably yeah. better off selling that to me for like you know, know like half of what it you know originally cost. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the 18 inch wheel, I. That's why I think I will probably go 19 inch on the Supra. So I haven't decided yet, but that yeah, driver confidence is where it's at because I'm pretty sure if given the right, you know, a little bit more time with the type R again, I only ran four laps in the type R this whole day. I could probably match the Supra's time because I just, it's so easy to drive. It's very intuitive. It even rev matches itself. Um, but yeah, the Supra automatic M2 manual Type R, somewhere in between a rev matching manual transmission that's very easy to shift. Um, no heel toe required. So yeah, between those three cars, my verdict is the Type R by far, by a huge margin, the best track car out of the box. Mm -hmm. If I had to take one off a showroom floor onto a track, it's the Type R any day. Um, I was passing 911s. I passed the Supra, and this is just in four laps, like um, like they were standing still. Like I, I don't know what these drivers driver level is at, but this is the last session of the day. They've had a lot of laps, and the Type R just drove laps around them. Like it's so easy to drive. I don't think I could pass them as easily in the Supra, just because I. I don't know what would happen if I had to lift or or break mid corner because I'm I'm following someone too closely or something like that. But the Type R, I just felt the confidence to push uh, myself uh, that much harder, and I think I could get real close. Um, the Supra, I think, out of the box, it's not a great track car, but it is fun on the street. And the M2, in its current form, is is uh the most fun that's the thing is that fr to me is still more fun than the ff that the 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 type r is easy to drive doesn't make it fun for me mm -hmm. i think when you've tracked so many years 
you don't want to go back to something that's easy mode. You want to challenge yourself a little bit. And I think that's where the Supra and M2 come in is that they, they are harder to drive, but they will reward you as well as punish you for, for your driving, um, you know, mannerisms. So the, the, the M2 is a lot more forgiving, but the Supra is uh, a little bit more not so forgiving uh, in its current guys. Now on the street, I think it's the other way around. I think the Supra is is kind of the most approachable, and it's it's easy to drive fast on the street. It's a it's a six or seven tenths car. It's not meant to be driven at ten tenths out of the mm. box, and that's where you kind of have to take every review with a grain of salt because it depends how each person is driving it. You know, some people are going to drive an M2 and they're going to think, oh, these brakes are amazing. The chassis is amazing because either they haven't driven anything else or they haven't driven it at that level yet. And that's where the Type R is great because the Type R is is pretty fun even at, at, at a five or six tenths pace. You don't have to be going crazy fast to enjoy the driving that car. Uh, the Supra is is pretty dull, going really slow, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it just feels like a regular car at that point. It make it feels so slow. Like that's the thing. Like you're going, you're going sixty, you know, slightly over the speed limit, and you feel like you're like standing still. <laughs> that car. Um, that's the problem. The um, um the Type R that you guys have, that's a 2021. 2021, so it's got mm. some slight revisions. Yeah, um, the uh, the increase of cooling capacity of the 2021 models. So I was surprised to hear that you still had um, overheating issues in it. Yeah, or yeah. Almost overheating issues. Almost overheating. I mean, no warning lights, didn't go into limb mode or anything. But I did see the temperature gauge max out. Yeah. Or, or about two bars from max. Yeah, we definitely um, don't want to damage those cars in any form, yeah. so... Well, I was looking at it like I have a warranty on this. <laughs> worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. This, Let's this use that warranty. warranty. It it doesn't even have an air filter in it. Like it's it's fully stock. Right. Uh so that was kind of the beauty of that car was that it it you know the super I actually slapped an intake on just because I was bored. <laughs> um but the, the type art does not even have an intake. It's just running really good oil and that's about it. Um, but yeah, it was a fun event. Thanks to Calson and the TSS Rev Scene team for hosting a great event. And yeah, we look forward to doing a bit more testing and tuning. I, I just want to see how these cars react to uh, whatever we throw at it and how do we make them faster, better to drive, and make ourselves better drivers. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, would love to go track days and stuff like that but you know it's not accessible for everyone a lot of people just take these cars on the streets and to really understand the dynamics like streets you're not going to be able to understand the full dynamics of the vehicle you just can't yeah. you can't explore a 400 horsepower car there's just yeah. not enough room for you to do so yeah without um, to putting the safely, public at great risk yeah <laughs> well yeah <laughs> to do it safely in a controlled condition, track days are your best friends. Um, and of course, with uh, TSS and RS, we're hoping to make track days more accessible to people. And that is the uh, the bottom line here. But let's move on to uh, the review of the week here. And let's talk a little bit about the new Elantra N-Line. So if you pause that video at where, where it was paused earlier... I thought this was an Audi. Like, look <laughs> at the bolstering on the left there. The seats, yeah. The seat shape, and then the little bit of paint that comes through the door frame. That is very Audi. Like, this is this is an S3 that you're sitting in. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be a lot less money than an S3. <laughs> yeah, even the back seat contour is very Audi. Yeah, so this is the the brand new Elantra N line. Um, the N line is. It's kind of like the SI, not a full Type R. So this isn't like, you know, track day duty type vehicle. And it doesn't have the brakes for it, as you can see there. Um, but it still has a 1.6 liter turbocharged engine, makes 201 horsepower. It's not a lot, but it's enough for this vehicle. It's made it to a DCT. 
unfortunately, no manual is offered in Canada. You can get it in the U.S. But what you have to know is it's cheaper than a Civic Si. It's cheaper than a GLI. It has plenty of Hyundai features. There's heated seats, heated steering wheel, stuff that you can't get on a lot of ma- um, like other vehicles. And it's inexpensive, right? Like it's it's the complete package of kind of what you want a little compact sports sedan to be. But the only thing I would say is, you know, kind of sucks is they killed off the Elantra GT, which is like their hatch. Um, I personally love the Elantra GT. It was a perfect like size of vehicle, um, but they kept going with the sedan, which is kind of weird. But, you know, Hyundai's coming up with the Kona N, like a full on N Kona. <laughs> Who, like, you know, <laughs> what's to say? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we see that with Toyota. The the Corolla hatch is kind of just an experimental car, I feel like. Honda's like, eh. And, you know, they're they're committing to the hatchback now, but they were kind of not that on board with the hatchback before. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, it's kind of interesting Hyundai killed that off. Is it available in other markets? It is. So the Elantra is available as the i30 in other markets as a hatchback, but Mm. just not here in North America. Don't know why. Yeah, maybe just poor sales or just not Mm -hmm. worth stocking. Yeah. So here's some specs that it's going to kind of, you know, it's a little crazy. It's 3,000 pounds. 3,020 pounds. So relatively lightweight for a front, you know, front wheel drive sedan is 28,000 Canadian dollars. Highway fuel economy, 6.6. Hmm. 6.6 liters, 100 kilometers, which means you have plenty more fun in this vehicle for a longer time. Right. Hmm. And like, it's such a good little package. It's just a styling that's a little quirky. Some absolutely hate it of all that geometric type design. Yeah. Um, this is the the older Elantra that I have on the screen. And a lot of people like that one because it was yeah, more... that one is clean. Yeah, it's a cleaner design. And it's, yeah. it's going to be a little bit more timeless than you know this one. Yeah, this but the one... interior on this one's a lot better than the old one. Yeah, I don't know how well this one will age compared to the old one, but... Uh... It is very striking, yeah. In a way, um, I'm not a huge fan of this this grill action that that Hyundai's done on the uh, Sonata and the Elantra, uh, and it's it's a little bit confusing to me which one is which. Like, <laughs> I don't know the differences between them that much anymore. Um, but yeah, I think the i30N looks better. The same. Yeah. <laughs> The i30N is it's what a lot of people are asking for, but they're, they're just not bringing it here. I don't know why. Maybe I can talk to someone at uh, the press relationships and just see if I can get a better answer from them. But yeah, the I, I think this is a, a fun little sedan. I think it's good for people that want to have just a little bit more fun on the streets, not taking this to track days or anything like that, but maybe autocross. Uh, yeah, it is lacking a limited car. slip diff on the front though so there's that yeah um yeah but- if you want something that's like kind of practical and sporty i think maybe the reason why we're not getting i30 is because of the veloster they 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 kind of want that car to work and it, it just doesn't though the veloster <laughs> really doesn't work the veloster so the veloster surprisingly formidable track car like yeah. i was impressed with that car i've uh i've driven that car a little bit and re- it's very much like the type r it's very uh very reassuring very easy car to handle and then but it makes cooler sounds <laughs> yeah it definitely is, does and and it looks a little bit more it looks a little bit more fun the type r looks a little bit more serious if if that's even if that even makes sense um, man, even the bolstering is very uh, Audi. <laughs> when I look at this thing, all I see is Audi. Um, but yeah, I think the Veloster is why they 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 committed. They're like we we only have room for one sporty hatchback uh, in in North America, so we will. Well, you know, Hyundai we'll is Veloster moving towards and, SUVs and the Conan. 
um, <laughs> to those, those two cars, that's going to be what we're going to offer for enthusiasts. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't have a, a GTI GTI competitor because we, we can't. We can't really compete directly against the GTI. And maybe that's why, yeah. Because the GTI is kind of, it's kind of soft core. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a dedicated race car, but it is, it is like a noticeable bump up in fun to drive factor than I think even a Mazda three turbo. Yeah. I don't think that car is that exciting to drive. No, I think the GTI is a little bit more entertaining, but it's also, I think that's where the I30N directly competes against. Uh, I feel like the I30N is a little bit more spicy. Yeah, a little bit more spicy. I think the I30N is between a GTI and a Golf R. Hmm. It's it's a little bit more than GTI because it it is more aggressive. There's more aggressive like seats. There's more ge- aggressive engine tuning, but it's nowhere near as good as a Golf R is, especially the uh, the Mark Eight. Yeah, I want to see. I I, I think. Yeah, I mean, look at look at Volkswagen. They're they're pulling out their golf like that. That is, that is uh, telling of the times. We would say. Yeah, I think the the Jetta has not been doing that well. It seems the Jetta does well with rental car markets. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, so that's where are... you'll see them the most. Yeah, yeah, but... and I think so. So does like every Hyundai model too. Yeah, yeah it really does. <laughs> yeah. They they check the boxes while being at a certain price point and meeting that criteria. And they, Hyundai he has always met criteria for the money very well. Um, but yeah, product planning wise, I don't know. I, I don't know if we need a hatchback. We want one, but will yeah, we... they just won't. They won't give it to us. Yeah. They'll they'll give us more SUVs before they'll bring the hatch over. Yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> That's what the people want, right? apparently <laughs> but look at us i mean we're not buying either so i i've been really interested in the tucson plug-in hybrid or uh santa fe plug-in hybrid yeah not because the uh that's what's available not the kona N. <laughs> no i don't i don't need kona's too small for for a family vehicle i think for everything that you need to carry, you need a slightly bigger SUV. That's why I'm looking at the Santa Fe a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I like the Santa Fe plug-in hybrid, but the plug-in hybrid, from what I can gather from Hyundai's website, isn't actually coming to Canada. Only oh. the uh, Tucson plug-in hybrid. You can get the Santa Fe mm. hybrid, but not a plug-in hybrid. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. Whenever it comes out, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, it might just be a part shortage kind of thing too. It is. I mean, the yeah. whole chip shortage thing, but yeah. In any case, I think that's really it for this week. Anything else you want to cover? Mm, no, I think we've covered everything. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for uh, listening in for this sports car or sports sedan version of uh, kicking tires. We'll uh, catch you next week for more exciting automotive news. See you guys Everyone. next week. No, you actually say bye this time. No. Oh. That's that's different. Should I end it here? No, should end I it awkwardly. It? End it awkwardly about 30 seconds from now. Yeah, and then like mid-sentence, and then I'm talking, and then I'll 